welcome to the Future of Tech webcast. My name is Stephen Dickens. I'm your host, and I'm joined today by Gunnar Hellickson from Red Hat. Hey, Gunnar, welcome to the show. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so I, we were talking off camera. Lots going on. I think it's really good. I appreciate you joining us. I think today, if we can give some context to some of the announcements, mm-hmm. I think There's a lot of chatter going on in the community. I've read a lot. There's been a lot said. I think really appreciate you joining the show. But let's start first by introducing your role. That'll provide some context to the listeners and viewers around kind of why you're here and why we're having this conversation. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Gunnar Hellickson. I've been with Red Hat for 16, almost 17 years now. I guess I started in 2006. Um, and today I'm the general manager and vice president for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that gives us a perfect segue. Lots going on. Obviously, in some announcements made that have resonated in the industry and in the community. <laughs> I saw the smile. <laughs> uh, so you made some announcements about CentOS Stream and it, how some of the thoughts there. I mean, let's maybe just dive straight in. Mm-hmm. Give us some context. Tell us what you announced yeah. and maybe some of the thinking there on kind of the rationale that you yeah. and the leadership team came to. Yeah, sure. So um, in order to understand the announcement, you first have to understand some kind of basics of, of how it is that we work, right? And uh, first and most important thing is that everything that Red Hat does is works through first the open source communities. Uh, Internally, we have an upstream first policy where every patch, every bug, every feature that we do has to be in the upstream first. Then it flows from one of the 13,000 open source projects that comprise Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It flows down through first the Fedora project, which which we sponsor. And then from the Fedora project, it flows down into, and you can think about Fedora as kind of like a peek into kind of what's coming up next for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the next major release, right? And then I think that's that, interesting you mentioned Fedora. It's not been part of the discussion. Yeah. So yeah. maybe double click there as you just sort of describe the thread. Because I think, I mean, I've read a lot over the last sort of couple of weeks mm-hmm. and everything's been around CentOS and the announcement. Not yeah. so much about the role Fedora plays in the, yeah. Yeah. So, so Fedora is a is a it's a, it is itself an open source project, and and the job there is to build the build a build an operating system, right? And so it means pulling together, not just for the purposes of building rel. They have their own communities, people building on Raspberry Pis, and people doing exotic things with the video editing, and and so lots of different communities inside it. But Fedora is the place where we let new ideas incubate, um, and that's where we come up with, oh well, we'll these experiments of like, where would this work? And would this work properly? And what if we tried it this way? And Fedora is the place where we can work some of those things out. Fedora moves very quickly as a result. Um, and it's our kind of first proving ground for for, for new ideas. Um, and it's a place for us to collaborate with a lot of these upstream communities. Um, and uh, let's say about every three years, then we take a look at what we're doing in Fedora and we kind of take a, you can, it doesn't exactly work like this, but you can kind of think of us taking a snapshot of what's in Fedora, and then that becomes moves into another project called CentOS Stream. And uh, from CentOS Stream, then we're building the next version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux in public. Now, what uh, what a lot of people don't totally understand is that we used to just go from Fedora or go from open source projects into Fedora and then into RHEL. And as a consequence of this, a lot of the development of Red Hat Enterprise Linux actually happened inside the walls of Red Hat. It actually wasn't very transparent at all, despite us being an open source company and having an upstream first policy, uh, the move or the introduction of this kind of intermediate CentOS stream step actually made 95% of the development that we do of Red Hat Enterprise Linux completely in the open. Um, mm-hmm. And we've been operating in this way for, for since the advent of CentOS stream. So from a completely open and transparent community like Fedora, then into an open and transparent community like CentOS Stream. And from CentOS Stream, we then build Red Hat Enterprise Linux, go through the testing with our partners, go through our certification processes, et cetera, et cetera, and then release a stable, supportable release that um, will last for uh, 10 years uh, for each major release. So every three years, we release a 
operating system that lasts for at least 10 years. And then every six months we update it. And each of those updates you can then sit on, you can park on for two, four, sometimes, you know, for some, sometimes longer. So at any given point, there are between 14 and 17 different versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux running, all fully supported, all getting security fixes and all the rest of it. Um, and so uh, a good way of understanding the difference between each of these projects is um, at each iteration, we go from Fedora and then into CentOS Stream and into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you're increasing the amount of testing, you're increasing the amount of certification, and you're increasing the amount of stability that is less and less changes as you move down this, this, uh, this kind of waterfall. Um, and so, uh, again, when we're building Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it is all open source. It was open in the upstream open source communities. It, was op it is open in Fedora, and it is open in CentOS Stream. So maybe that, and that's fantastic context. And I think that level of sort of almost pipeline for how the code gets yeah. developed is really interesting. Yeah. Obviously made some specific announcements in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Do you want to maybe just spend a couple of minutes there of what yeah. you what you announced and what the thinking was? Yeah, sure. So uh, back in the Fedora and RHEL days, like before the introduction of CentOS Stream, um, we made uh, source code available in, in two ways. Uh, that is the source code for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. First, we made it available to our customers through our customer portal, as you might expect. Um, yep. And we also made it available through uh, an FTP site. Um, uh, and th through that FTP site, then downstream rebuilds were, would, would take that source code and then they would go build, say, CentOS, uh, for example, CentOS Linux. Um, and about two years ago, the CentOS project changed its strategy. So it was no longer a downstream rebuild and it now became that midstream CentOS stream that I just described. Mm -hmm. But we still kept releasing our source code on that git.centos.org uh, uh, site, um, mostly frankly out of kind of muscle memory. It was just kind of what yeah. we were doing and so we just kept doing it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so now we have three places where we're releasing the source code for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now we have CentOS Stream because everything that goes into RHEL goes into CentOS Stream first. So it's in CentOS Stream and it's in the customer portal and it's in git.centos.org. Um, so this seems innocuous. It's not that big a deal to be releasing source code in three different places. Um, it's a, a kind of an aggressive way of complying with the GPL, the GNU public license um, that we're under. but but it, it's fine, it's kind of innocuous. Um, the, the trouble was that because we were publishing that source code to git.centos.org to the public where, where you can download it, um, we had uh, several rebuilders uh, like uh, Rocky, like Alma, uh, were taking that source code and then rebuilding RHEL from, from that source code and then claiming bug for bug compatibility with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and so if you separate out, there's two sets of concerns here. There's a, there's a set of licensing concerns and then there's a set of kind of commercial concerns. And I'll, and I'll say the kind of quiet part out loud on the commercial concerns is um, we're not interested in encouraging people to go rebuild Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We're not interested in making that easier. Um, we have a commercial product that we think is extremely valuable. We sell it for money and uh, we feel very comfortable not making it easy to create a, a clone of our own product, right? And, and I think f from looking at this and analyzing this, I think this gets lost in the discussion. Red Hat's a commercial business. You're taking the, the sort of pipeline of free community developed Mm -hmm. adding a significant amount of value, testing, certification, support, and they're looking to build a commercial business off that. Yeah. You're not alone in doing this. I had Ash Kulkarni, the CEO of Elastic, on this podcast a yeah. few weeks back. Right. We, we've spent some time at MongoDB and spoke to their team. Yeah. This is a standard model of how you support a community, yeah. and there's a lot of um, – sort of investment I know that Red Hat makes in community building. I was at a KubeCon and your community days, you yeah. put a lot of your money, time and effort into yeah. building those communities. But ultimately you're a for-profit business that's looking to build a commercial enterprise yeah. and, and 
have got ultimately now sort of uh, responsibility to shareholders and to various entities to make profit from your your activities and efforts. So I think that gets lost yeah. in the discussion. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's right. And so, and then which brings us to the the, the first. Uh, so there's the set of commercial concerns, and then there's the set of kind of licensing and, and open source concerns. And, and of course, the, the first reaction, which makes perfect sense, is, well, they're violating the GPL, right? They're violating the letter of the GPL. They're violating the spirit of the GPL. Uh, I think the consensus that we're seeing now and the reaction, the consensus is that we may be a, we're abiding certainly by the letter of the GPL. We're not actually violating the terms of the license. Um, and that's because... Anyone who receives our binaries still receives our source code. That is what the that is what the GPL requires. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we're we continue to go, I think, above and beyond what the GPL requires by doing things like making sure all our contributions are upstream first, by doing things like doing all of our open all of our development in the open in CentOS stream. Um, these are all. Uh, these are all intent. These are all actions that we take to do things in the open because we see benefit in working with open source communities. We take all our contributions, everything we build, we contribute back. Um, this is what a healthy open source ecosystem looks like. Right? Um, and uh, and now the and what's interesting and totally fascinating is the interaction between the GNU public license, the GPL, and our enterprise agreement. And uh, and there's been a great deal written on this in the last uh, in the last week and a half. But the uh, the truth is that the that we do comply with the GPL, and we also are entitled to put a set of terms on the on the software that we deliver. And so that says that listen, we're going to put some terms on how you're allowed to use our software, and the, if you violate that, we don't take anything away from your rights to use the GPL, but we do reserve the right to no longer have a commercial relationship with you. Um, and so these two things are not in conflict. They just, they work side by side. Um, and one doesn't override the other. And that level of provision around what is enterprise software is not new, is not revolutionary. Right. It's the way the software industry has been built over the last multiple decades, whether you ask Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, yeah. anybody who's selling commercial software, there'll yeah. be a set of terms around how you use that software. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now. A lot of these, uh, uh, I, I will say too that I think um, a lot of these are what it comes down to is that there's legal arguments you can make and there's kind of moral arguments that you can make. I mean, I think the thing that is the, the truth is that this was disruptive to a certain number of people who were relying on the existence of these downstream rebuilds, um, either because they did not have the, the the means or interest in paying Red Hat for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and they still wanted to benefit from the from the from the software that we shipped, um, and I can understand why that would be disappointing, right? That that makes that makes sense to me, <laughs> right? I can imagine why that would be uh, that would be disruptive. Um, but I think the it is also true that we have made Red Hat Enterprise Linux, especially over the last several years, we have made it more available and more freely available than it ever has been. Um, customers have we have a, a Red Hat for Open Source infrastructure program. We have the developer for individuals program, which you can now run RHEL in production up, up to 16 systems. You can run in production for free. Um, all you have to do is go sign up for the developer program and and we let you do that. Um, and never mind a whole bunch of you know kind of commercial different kinds of commercial relationships and discounts and all kinds of stuff that we can that we that we can make available. So I think the um, uh, I feel comfortable. There's always more that we can do to make RHEL more available for different kinds of use cases, making it easier to consume, um, making managing subscriptions less odious. Um, I mean, that's all stuff that that we're extremely interested in improving. Um, but uh, at this, that does not, just because we have, uh, say, friction over here, or um, we still have work to do on making, making RHEL more available, um, that does not mean for for our purposes, that does not mean that we have to make things easier for these downstream rebuilders. Um, so you you've touched on it a little bit, but I'll maybe ask the question: Can you elaborate then what you think the announcements made? What is it, ten days ago now, or how, uh, just however many days ago when this airs? What what those what those announcement means for customers and more widely for the industry as a whole? Yeah. So. 
Uh, in terms of customers, the announcement means nothing for customers. They have all the rights and privileges they had before. They have the same stability they had before, same liability they had before. They're getting the same software they have before. Red Hat's policies haven't changed. Everything is 100% totally normal. So uh, let's just pause there. You're an enterprise customer. You're a Red Hat paying customer. You're on a you're on a support contract. No changes whatsoever. Yeah, you still you still got your lifecycle promises. You still got your security promises. You still got your stability promises. All these all these things are still available to you, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I think what's different is here. Here's the funny thing: is I can't actually tell you what's different yet <laughs> because, because what we've done is said, okay, well, we're not going to publish our source code in this particular place, and if you want our source code, you can go here or you can go here, right? And what matters now is how the downstream, what the downstream communities do, right? Um, now they have to now they have to find another way of doing the thing that they wanted to do. Now, what we would prefer that they do is go work in places like CentOS Stream, which is specifically designed to go collaborate with other people on building an operating system. So, if people want to create a variant of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, then CentOS Stream allows them to do that, right? If you want to go build Red Hat Enterprise Linux for I don't know, Raspberry Pi, if you want to, like, you can do that in CentOS Stream. That's what it's designed to do. Um, and so I, I would love it if these, if the downstream rebuilders worked through the CentOS Stream source code as opposed to our, as opposed to our downstream. Um, again, going back to this thing, we're not, uh, we're not explicitly preventing them from doing what they're doing. What we're doing is not making it easier because we don't see a reason to make it easier. Yeah. Um, and so if they find a way of doing what they're doing through CentOS Stream, that is uh, that is what CentOS Stream is for, right? So one thing that's come to the fore and lots of heat and noise from the community, sort of I've seen that the whole gamut of reaction, you know, the, and the community is very good at getting riled up and, and commenting and being vocal. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing I'd like to understand is, What's Red Hat's commitment to the open source community? I've seen that up front. We talked about KubeCon. I sat through one of your community days where there was a lot of focus and time and effort that Red Hat had put in to alt and cost into hosting a community event that would have benefited a lot of other people outside of just Red Hat. Yeah. But maybe I've got an access to this that maybe other people haven't seen. So maybe the simple question is, Give me a view of Red Hat's commitment to open source. Yeah, uh, Red Hat's commitment to open source hasn't changed a bit. Um, I'll, I'll say it again for the record. <laughs> um, everything, we have an upstream first policy. Everything that we do in Red Hat Enterprise Linux has to be upstream first. Uh, and I'll tell you internally, this creates, uh, this makes things very difficult sometimes. I mean, there is <laughs> software that we would love to ship soon or we would love to get out the door earlier. Uh, but we force ourselves to go through the upstream process, go through the community process, um, because we feel like that adds value. And it's also an obligation that we have to those communities from which we pull. Like we rely on those communities in order to build our product. And so we owe it to them to make sure that the improvements that we make end up going back into those communities. You know, sometimes it doesn't happen as fast as we would like, but we, we still do it uh, because we think it's important. It's an important part of the, in order to maintain a healthy ecosystem, that's, that is what you need to do: is contribute back um, to the places uh, to the places that you draw from. Um, that's I think that's kind of core to the to the open source ethos. Um, and so, and again, uh, we remain committed. We are famously an open source company, and we take that very, very, very seriously. Um, and that's why all our products are open source products. Um, that's why we contribute to the upstreams. That's why we sponsor community events. Um, that's why when we see open source projects that we're interested in and we have, we have, we have that we have interest in, we will go hire the people that are working in those upstream projects in order to make, make sure that those projects stay healthy and, and, uh, and stay useful. Um, so open source is very, very deep in our DNA. And I, and I feel comfortable saying that that nothing about that has changed. So, one of the questions um, that's specifically here is we know that CentOS is starting to become a, a end of life. Mm -hmm. That's approaching us yeah. June 2024. Yeah. People are starting to think ar ar around what they do there. Yeah. What would you describe as some of those migration options, thoughts, as people start to plan ahead for summer yeah. next year? Yeah, sure. So... 
uh, that's right. So June 30th of 2024 is coming and it's going to come faster than anybody wants. <laughs> and so <laughs> these things always come around. Right. Uh, and that is coincident actually with another interesting moment, which is the end of life of, of rel seven. Um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, what I'm encouraging everybody to do is look at all of the options, uh, for CentOS seven. Um, uh, there, are, there are, there are several available to you. Um, of course, I'm going to talk about the rel options, but there are many others in the market. You should take a look at those. I consider my job is not to force everybody into a Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I'm not interested in getting business that way. What I will do is make sure that rel is the most attractive option. And so to that end, we've done things like uh, improve the tooling for converting CentOS systems over to Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. Um, we have created uh, more promotions and discounts than I can even imagine in helping people with the transition because we recognize that the the cost of the the act of transitioning from CentOS to something else is it's not just a matter of like a software cost it's also the cost of calories and time and attention and so we're trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to to transition into Red Hat Enterprise Linux because we feel like that's the best choice. Um, and if they do transition into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we can offer them the option of staying on uh, version seven for uh, for years after the end of life of of seven. So we can you can stay there for two years or, or four years. And so the uh, a lot giving people as much flexibility and allowing them to buy as much time as they can. I know with especially with COVID and the way that the labor market is working and the way that the economy is going. Um, nobody's migration plans are going as smoothly or as quickly as mm -hmm. they would like. Um, and so we've created as much runway as we can to kind of allow people to buy time. And um, parenthetically, this is exactly what Red Hat Enterprise Linux does, um, is allow you to stay in one place, give you a collection point, a point of stability, so that you can manage things like your transition costs and your migration costs. Um, and so our ability to deliver another two years of life on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, that option is kind of a core value of what you're getting when you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So that's the, I suppose, enterprise space. Right. Sounds very well covered. You guys have long had a pathway for somebody who's sort of maybe starting their Linux journey or moving workloads and, and needs a, that supported base. Yeah. What about that non-enterprise developer journey? What, where, where do you see Red Hat's kind of position yeah. there? And what are you doing to encourage that space? Yeah, sure. So uh, so it's, it's so remember, I, we were talking about that waterfall of mm -hmm. you know, the upstream projects to Fedora, to CentOS Stream, and to, and to Red Enterprise Linux. And the truth is that one of the beautiful things about this, this ecosystem, you know, this pipeline that we have, is that uh, depending on the kind of work that you're doing, there is going to be a place for you to do that work. Uh, and so the kind of person who likes mucking around in operating systems and figuring out how to make storage subsystems work correctly, you're gonna find a great audience in the Fedora project. Um, if you're the kind of person who says, uh, well, what would it mean to put Red Hat Enterprise Linux on a Raspberry Pi or make it uh, fit on this this tiny device here, that CentOS Stream is a great place to do that work. Uh, if I want to do optimizations for a particular piece of hardware, CentOS Stream is a great place to experiment with things like that. Um, and if you're looking to, if you're building an application for, uh, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, for example, um, through the partner program and through the developer programs, you have all the free access to Red Hat Enterprise Linux you, you could possibly want. And combine that with CentOS Stream, and what you have is the ability to not just build against your application or your project against Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you also have the ability through CentOS Stream to test against the next version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Mm -hmm. So you get a heads up, you don't have to wait for us to drop a beta. You can actually watch the development over time, put it in your CI system and make sure that the no regressions are introduced um, as you go. And so uh, we have, as I said, uh, as I said earlier, I feel like we have made, if you think about Red Hat Enterprise Linux in its entirety, the whole ecosystem that goes into building Red Hat Enterprise Linux, I feel like we have lots of places where people can insert themselves to both contribute and also to, uh, to build on top of um, depending on your cadence, depending on your speed, depending on the kind of stability you want, depending on who your target audience is. We have lots of different places where people can work. And that's one of the nice things about working in the open source community is um, I don't just have one commercial product to give you and you have to work on that commercial product. You have all these all these choices available to you. So kind of we've had a free ranging conversation. 
part of this was to give you a platform to be able to engage with the community. Is there anything I've maybe not asked you that you've seen come up over the last sort of seven to 10 days that you feel I should? Uh, let's see. I, you know, I think one thing, uh, one thing that has surprised me is, uh, is when, when we were living in a world of CentOS Linux, for example, um, and, and living in this is I think people understand that I know that people believe in what Red Hat Enterprise Linux is doing because so many people are using Red Hat Enterprise Linux and these and these downstream derivatives. Um, I think it's interesting to think of the this notion that what Red Hat Enterprise what Red Hat is doing through Ent Red Hat Enterprise Linux that uh, that that was always duplicated downstream and it was always available for free and and the truth is that. It, it wasn't all available downstream and available for free. Um, the CentOS project for years had trouble keeping up with what Red Hat Enterprise Linux was doing. Um, when you were on CentOS, uh, when you were on CentOS Linux, uh, the patches and the security fixes would kind of dip a little bit as we transitioned from one version to another, right? There was, they, they always wanted to be close to us, but they, they sometimes had a hard time, hard time doing it. Um, things like, the latest version of, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they could keep pace with, but past versions of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, they they did not keep pace with. And so I think, uh, I mean, I've talked to people who are, who are under the misunderstanding that, that a lot of these downstream projects kind of perfectly duplicate the Red Hat Enterprise Linux experience. And the truth is that they they never did. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think, so what I would encourage, but what I'm hoping happens next is that people realize that they can take advantage of CentOS Stream and use it for what it is intended to do, which is go encourage variants of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and try new things out and go do new things and add things into the ecosystem in order to make it more healthy and, and more sustainable for everyone. Um, and uh, anyway, th so that's my that's my wish. That's what I hope happens next. So gonna what freewheeling conversation and really appreciate the transparency as we talked off camera, you weren't you you weren't up for ducking any questions, and you've certainly not ducked any of the questions while we talk here. Yeah. What would be those key, sort of three key sentences, three key takeaways that you'd like the community and enterprise customers and those yeah. non-enterprise developers uh, to take away from our discussion and, and, and really the thought process behind why you made the announcements? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so for customers and partners, Nothing, nothing has changed about Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It is still the same. It's the same software built the same way with the same open source commitment that we've had for the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is for the community, uh, please avail yourself of all of the community focused programs, the developer programs that we have available. They are designed to help you. Um, and if you find yourself in a, working on a project or working on a product that needs Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we have done everything that we can to make that Red Hat Enterprise Linux available to you and make it easy for you to get. Um, and the and the third thing is that the uh, I would encourage everybody to think about Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the end product of a much longer pipeline of work than that Red Hat is involved in every step of, and all those steps are available to everyone else as well. People can work in Fedora. People can work in the upstream communities. People can work in CentOS Stream, and all of this, all the work in there, still accrues to to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and so, find the community, find the spot in the pipeline where you're most comfortable working, and and and, and work there. Right. Um, so that I mean, I think that's what I would like to leave folks with. Fantastic. Well, going to appreciate you jumping on with us here. Um, now you've got a busy, um, with busy sort of schedule. So getting you on the sort of day after 4th of July, really appreciate it. Thanks for the transparency. Tough discussion, but I think really appreciate your comments and the, and the willingness to pretty much ask, a, a, answer any questions that I've got here. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks very much. So you've been watching us here on the Future and Tech webcast. Please click and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.